with us is Manuel Lavoy, Executive Director of the Central Office of Recovery, Reconstruction, and Resiliency, known as Core 3. Thank you for being with us. We appreciate your time, Mr. Lavoy. Um, no, thank you for the opportunity uh, to have this interview and discuss uh, everything that we need to know about the state of the reconstruction and recovery of Puerto Rico. And I think it's very important, obviously it's very important, um, especially because there are so many uh, comments and, and concerns regarding the uh, speed with which this has been moving, which has, you know, it seems that it's been stagnant. So one of the things I wanted to talk about, first of all, um, you mentioned that, you know, with your arrival at that agency, you were going to be implementing different procedures or you were, gonna, you were gonna be rethinking the procedures to be able to get project funding out once FEMA approves and all the paperwork is in. Can you talk a little bit about that and how it's gonna happen and how quickly it's gonna happen? Yes, I think it is important to um, go back to certain basic uh, description of how this works, right? Um, and I would like to do that in, in three phases. Because okay. the way I see it, we've been going through different phases of the uh, disaster recovery uh, for Maria specifically. And after almost, you know, three years and a half, right, um, I, we can really uh, establish those uh, clear phases. And the first phase was after the, uh, the, you know, the hurricane hit Puerto Rico and devastated Puerto Rico. And while we were in the middle of stabilizing the emergency, uh, there was a lot of effort by the federal government and Puerto Rico to approve uh, a, or allocate uh, billions of dollars mm -hmm. from FEMA programs and from the, uh, the federal uh, department uh, of housing right. to basically assign it to Puerto Rico for the overall recovery. Uh, when things like that happen, it's not like automatically the money is transferred or uh, you know, like um, the the scope and the level of detail is not sorted out at that moment. This is basically uh, major allocations with uh, certain requirements that need to be in place in order to then go through the specifics and and determine you know the projects that are necessary to do the the recovery, right? So in, so, other words, so in other words, so that people understand, the money is allocated, meaning that it's reserved, but it's correct. not necessarily dispersed. Correct. And allocated uh, as a whole, as, as a big chunk, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, when Congress approved the different assignments or allocations, right, uh, for Puerto Rico, there were two major buckets, right? Number one, mm -hmm. FEMA, with, and which basically manages the main program, which is called uh, um, public assistance. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. public assistance is the major bucket right, to right. actually address uh, all the damages and reconstruct according to those damages per FEMA's requirements, which means that we need to reconstruct according to the state of those uh, facilities or assets prior to the hurricane. Mm -hmm. And in accordance to the construction code, subject for those facilities. That is the major chunk. Assistant public assistance is right now probably, I don't know, $35 billion around that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you add a second program of FEMA, which is hazard mitigation, which adds resiliency and adds a number of other parameters to minimize the, the, you know, the loss of life and property in the future uh, if another disaster comes. And the idea is to save lives and also the, uh, you know, our reaction, you know, the performance of the island in another hurricane mm -hmm. will be uh, more cost effective, right? Yeah, and hopefully not to have a repeat performance of exactly. the disaster. Exactly. So altogether, PA, uh, you know, FEMA with PA hazard mitigation right now is around $40 billion. And the first phase is to basically say, you are approved $40 billion. Mm -hmm. Same thing happened with CDBG, which they approved $20 billion, all right? Mm -hmm. So altogether, it's above $60 billion plus other, you know, other programs, but that's, that's the bulk of the programs. Mm -hmm. 
So it is important to understand that once it's approved as a as a as a you know as a bucket, right? An application, right, right. You need to now do all the specifics to delineate and define the projects that will happen in each individual municipality and in each agency that will basically go against that major approval. And that process is called obligation. Right. Okay. So in the first phase that I probably will categorize between early 2018 and some point in 2019, mm -hmm. there were a lot of challenges. And one of those challenges is that this had no precedent. Mm -hmm. FEMA had never, never, ever encountered such a complex recovery. The damages were, you know, uh, no benchmark. Right. Just to give you an idea, um, PREPA has been obligated $10 billion, 10,000, you know, 10 billion, right? Yeah, yeah. That is the single most uh, number obligated for any jurisdiction in the U.S. But have they gotten any of the money yet? That's no. the thing. I mean, you can obligate and put everything on paper, but when when is it going to get Exactly. exactly. So I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to put it in context, right? So the first phase, uh, because it was it has no precedent, this, there was a lot of changes. A lot of things that happened, we can call it trial and error because this has no precedent. Mm -hmm. How can we really move from this big chunk and obligate different projects? Um, so that trial and error was the first phase. Then I will say that the second phase, which is basically led by my, my immediate predecessor, Otmar Chavez, mm -hmm. was, okay, now that we sort this out, let's push forward and obligate. Because that's the first thing. You, you cannot even think about money if you don't obligate the projects. Right. So the second phase ran between sometime 2019 all the way to 2020. And there was major milestones because today FEMA has obligated over 65% of all the projects for Maria. Okay. Including PREPA, PRASA, the Department of Education, and, and, and the rest of the municipalities and the agencies. Altogether, about $23 billion have been obligated, 65% of all the universal projects. Okay. And now we're going to enter into the third phase, which is your question, right? Now we have all this money obligated. There's another 35% remaining to be obligated, but now we have a lot of money obligated. Mm -hmm. What happens now? why we don't see all this money flowing, going, right. flowing. Right. And I will say that it has a, to do with four major factors that we are addressing, right? Mm -hmm. Number one, FEMA works uh, in terms of, of obligating money and using money is based on reimbursement. Okay. Meaning right. that the municipality or the agency has to have a financial capability to start moving the projects. What, what is the meaning of moving project? Um, doing the RFPs for the engineering and the architecture. Mm -hmm. Once you do the RFP, then ex, you know, implement the engineering and the architecture and, and the construction plans and the permitting. And then you will do another RFP because it has to be competitive all the time to select the contractors. And then once you select the contractors, you do the actual construction job, right? Okay. That is the responsibility of the municipalities and the agencies. But this is like the chicken or the egg. I'm going to reimburse you, but if you don't have money in the first place, have money. Exactly. nothing happens, right? It's the case for many municipalities. There are many of them that are bankrupt. So exactly. how does that work? So the first item, the first, that I said four factors. The first one was uh, lack of financing, right? The lack of capital on behalf of the subrecipients. A subrecipient is the municipality or the agency. We are the, re the recipient. Mm -hmm. So the, to address that, we are establishing a, a fund with a FAF, okay. which is which will basically function as a as a loan. Okay. And it will be like a, a rotation, right? A, a, a rotative type of fund, mm -hmm. a revolving fund. Uh, where initially we have approval from the fiscal board for $750 million, which Maybe it's well, actually it's a small figure, but at least it's good to start, and it's then we'll start, right. right, and we will work with the fiscal board to determine whether we need more, more, more money. And but when and when can can municipalities start dipping into that fund? The I, the target is to launch that next month. Next month, okay. Okay, so next month, this seven hundred fifty million dollar revolving fund will be launched, 
and the municipalities and the agency will be able to get loans, have the capital, move with their competitive process, engineering, architecture, permitting, and construction, and then parallel to that, which gets to my second point, then we will be reimbursing according to those um, uh, activities completed, right? Okay, and so when you reimburse, that means the municipality needs to send that money back to the rotating exactly. fund, right? The exactly. Fund? Okay. exactly. And then it will be like an oil machine, well-established to get cash flow, because this is about cash flow, right? Right, right. Get the cash flow going. Now, the, 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 the second point is that I need to increase my efficiency and remove, remove roadblocks in terms of bureaucracy to ensure that the, those re reimbursements flow. That's the second target. And that's completely on me, on the core three, right? Mm -hmm. So right now, we are reviewing our policies, reviewing, reviewing our procedures, and reviewing our digital system, our technology platform, to ensure that we can really streamline and we can be more efficient tackling all these reimbursements requisitions. Okay? How, quickly, how quickly do you see that happening? Because, and I keep stressing on time because it's been three and a half years. So how quickly do you foresee that happening? Next month. The target next is month. also next month, okay. we're going to have our policies review. The, the digital system, which is called um, <clears throat> Disaster Recovery Solution, DRS, is, will be also updated according to, this, to the revised policies. And my expectation is that it, that will be launched next month. So by April, you will start seeing some of the initial improvements in okay. terms of how agile we can be with that. Having said that, we inherited a huge backlog of reimbursement uh, so this, uh, requirement. How much? Uh, how much? Uh, quest, right? How many, I don't have the actual number right now because we are in the forensic a review of it okay all i can say is that the backlog is unacceptable so i have a task force to bring down to acceptable levels our backlog okay. and that also will be targeted for next month you know so by by this first trimester we'll have under control our backlog okay. and in parallel we'll we have been review we will be review we'll have be able to review the policy and the system so moving forward we don't get into that backlog again so okay. those are the two things okay so, so it should be that the core three should not be blamed anymore for being um, a stumbling block to get this money flow. I believe that if we can, uh, if we're able to successfully launch the revolving uh, loan, uh, fund, and number two, we update these policies and we put under control this backlog, I think that we will be able to address most of the concerns uh, and the red flags that have been raised by the municipalities and the agencies. I, I'm where, very where is that 750 million coming from? It's a state fund okay. uh, that was approved by the legislature and then it was approved by fiscal board. So okay. it's a state fund that will be used for, for, for that. Okay. Now, the third thing, uh, because this is not going to cut it alone, right? There are two additional things that we need to do. The third thing is actual execution capability meaning right. that the municipality and or the agency need to have in place the team and the resources to actually execute projects and manage their grants. Mm -hmm. Now you have agencies like Prasa that are pretty good at what they do because they are used to manage capital projects. So I don't have a problem with Prasa. Prasa is probably the standard, the okay. gold standard to push for those projects. But then you have other agencies that are not used to or not have the capability to move fast those projects you don't have right. the resources or whatever you have an example yeah. maybe um no, i don't want to share yet but uh I want, but let me tell you that i can tell you that we are working with them to start having some action plans on how we can tackle that okay, okay? okay. and you have municipalities like bayamon like carolina that are really good moving their projects and they have the teams and then you have smaller municipalities that they need help, okay? That one I can share because the obvious situation is Vieques and the hospital. Vieques, right. Okay. And these, are, are they usually autonomous municipalities, the ones that are doing better or that are better equipped to? Well, I will say fire? that it's, it's, it's a combination of two things. Number one, whether the major has as a top priority this, that's number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, according to that, whether they were able to successfully assemble a team 
of employees and consultants to have the technical knowledge and a full-time dedication to push for these projects. Mm -hmm. okay? So that would now, mean probably hiring people. Again, exactly. they, need, they, people. they need money to be able to hire people. So <laughs> I know, I know. And that's why, well, that's why we talk about the chicken or the egg, right? Mm -hmm. But um, but we were able to address you know the financing part hopefully you know with this fund uh, and and the third the fourth thing so even if we do the the financing core three more more efficient moving reimbursements and the municipalities and agencies uh, strengthening their their teams right to manage the projects and the grants then there's one fourth component and is the capability of the construction sector. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. Getting people to actually work. Exactly. And that is probably the first three. I'm very confident that we are going to be able to tackle that soon. The fourth is the one that we are discussing at the Reconstruction Council mm -hmm. with, you know, led by, by the Secretary of State, Ladisa Hammer, mm -hmm. because that is a more complex situation, right? Um, it's supply and demand. And for the last three years, the construction sector has been eager to, you know, to ramp up their operations, but the projects were not there, right? Now the projects are going to be, is, you're going to be start seeing good projects in 2021, a number of RFPs for engineering and for construction. So hopefully now the construction sector that will really see, oh, this is really happening. They're going to make the adjustments as a, as a sector to get the workforce, the materials, and the machining equipment that they need to meet the demand because okay, the demand but, is a big, but, but specifically big, the, the construction sector also has this thing going where it was a back and forth with the minimum wage the the you know once 15 dollar minimum yes. hour wage was done was eliminated so that in a way may not work to you know attract workers um, as it may have when it was in effect, right? It is part of the discussion that we're having at the council. Um, and it's it's multi-layer, right? Um, because you have now Biden's proposal, President Biden's proposal mm -hmm. uh, to raise increased minimum wage to $15 an hour. Mm -hmm. Also, there are voices in Puerto Rico. Le legislature, the governor already said that he wants to do that and we agree with him, you know, we support his policy. Mm -hmm. So it remains to be seen how it will be implemented. But I think that uh, the sector is prepared to understand that this is going to happen somehow and it will probably be in phases. But at the end of the day, you know, you bring a good point. I mean, we, I saw, I remember seeing before I became director of Core 3 an estimate that the sector will require an additional 100,000 people. I remember that number. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know what? I think it's about that. It could be a little bit more. It could be more. How do you, how do you get 100,000 people to work in construction? So certainly one area is that it has to be attractive for the employee, mm -hmm. for the employees, like you said. So sure. uh, number one. Number two, it would require a lot of effort in terms of, of training because you need um, people that are skilled, you know, mm -hmm. uh, especially um, there's going to be projects that are kind of easy going, you know, like repairing a municipal road. Mm -hmm. And you have other projects that are really, really, really complicated, right? Right. So the skill set is going to be important in order to meet the quality of the, of the construction that is required at the cost that was estimated mm -hmm. and meeting the requirements of the federal government, right? So that is, that is a challenge. And hopefully the council, uh, you know, we are going to be working together in this council to work with the construction sector and, and, and basically come up with the different actions that are required to get there. Do, has the council mentioned the possibility of bringing in outside uh, workers, you know, off island workers, or do we have enough people here to get the jobs done? I will not uh, uh, speculate on that yet because okay. the council created a subcommittee okay. that is specifically going to work on the workforce issue, right? Um, and there are different ways to handle this, right? Um, but I will not, uh, you know, say whether that is a viable option and whether okay. it's going to be considered or not, right? That's part of the evaluation, the overall evaluation that okay. this committee needs to do. Okay. 
Okay, and then earlier you mentioned Vieques. That is one of yes. probably one of the most extreme and dire um, examples, right? Of of what needs to be done quickly. They don't have a municipal hospital. Um, so, is there any possibility, perhaps in general, to take you know cases and expedite, you know, expedite them and get them going quicker? Um, to be able to solve say, these situations or, you know, health related issues and whatnot? Generally speaking, yes, right? But the devil is in the detail, right? Um, the problem with the Vieques Hospital is that the funds were obligated last year in January. Mm -hmm. One year later, nothing has happened, right? Which is but sad. Then we've, we've had a pandemic. You know, yes, that. It, the, the pandemic is a factor, you're right, but my point is that once the project, once the money is obligated, at the end of the day is the responsibility of the subrecipient. Okay, the, case, the municipality. The, the municipality is responsible for the project. Okay. What yeah. has happened is that um, all data points out that they were not able to put together a team Okay. That has, you know, the expertise and the knowledge to actually move such a high visibility complex project, right? Mm -hmm. And there were attempts to do RFPs to get a project management office. Right. And they all failed. Okay. A year later, literally, we haven't moved an inch. Now, what should we do moving forward? Right. That was uh, my question. Can Core 3 step in and help? or some sort of, you know, a government agency or somebody, can somebody yes. step in and help? We are finalizing a strategy that we already discussed preliminary with the governor and also with the major. Okay. Uh, we are finalizing the details of how the strategy could be deployed. And we hope to announce that sometime probably, if not before this month, it will be early March. Okay. okay? And one possibility is that Core 3 plays an active role as, ma you know, as a manager of the project, right? Mm -hmm. That's one possibility. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we are working on the details. We're going to present the business case to the major. And if he agrees with what we're presenting, there is a possibility that we can be very active in addressing the needs of moving forward the project. But oh, and one, also, thing and I know, uh -huh. go ahead, go ahead. one thing I know is that we won't be acceptable for another couple of months, going back and forth, we need to have a decisive. It needs to happen. It needs to happen. You and have a new. You also have a new mayor. Mayor in Vieques. Exactly. So, um, you know, perhaps he's coming in with a, a new set of ideas or yes. capabilities. Um, yes. But the truth is that Vieques needs um, needs help. Right. I mean, they 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 need a, a municipal hospital getting to and from, you know, Vieques and Puerto Rico. Uh, that's a whole nother story because the ferry right. system and whatnot. So, you know, um, you, sh you should then be stepping in in the next couple of weeks. Right. For them. Yes. Also, yes. So that what what else is in that pipeline, that immediate pipeline for perhaps the next, you know, six months, a year for core three. So um, I mentioned accelerate uh, the access to capital, right? And and the removing the roadblocks for a more efficient process for reimbursement. That's number one. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, I did mention, uh, let me look at my list here. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, oh, um, I'd mentioned, you know, uh, the support to the subrecipients, right? Like right. Vieques, and there are other agencies that may be in similar situations. So a core three more active with the subrecipients to ensure that projects move along. That's a number two priority. Okay. The number three priority, I will say, is to ensure that we meet the deadlines of FEMA to present all the proposals for the hazard mitigation program 404. Mm -hmm. We have $4 billion between FEMA and CDBG MIT. And this is a state-driven, state policy-driven project, as long as it uh, meets the eligibility requirements of FEMA for these projects. And it's been a little, uh, I don't know, you know, the term will be, so, right? yeah, challenging, very challenging. Right. Uh, and we were able, before I got into this job, 
we were able to get an extension from FEMA for October. And that's the last one. This okay, is the very last extension. Is that program under the Department of Housing or is that also under Core 3, the CBC? It's under Core 3 and, and housing basically provides a, a global match, the $1 billion as a match to the $3 billion from FEMA. Okay. okay. But it's really run on us, of course, with the support and, and, and the collaboration of Vivienda. Mm -hmm. And right now we are pivoting the plan and, you know, and making changes in the direction and the strategy to ensure that we meet the milestone of submitting all proposals on or before October 2021. So that is a top priority. That's the deadline. You. Okay. That's the deadline. Now okay. that deadline, that deadline puts you right smack again, right, right before, right in the middle of the hurricane season. I mean, I think that, um, and one of my questions to you was, you know, how quickly is Puerto Rico going to see the elimination of the blue tarps? I mean, there are people still living, you know, in homes covered by tarps, um, and their hurricane seasons seem to get stronger every year. So, you know, do you have any ideas to? when that could also be you know resolved <clears throat> to be honest uh this is something that falls directly under the responsibility of vivienda okay. right uh, so i don't have that data i know that the new secretary has expressed a sense of urgency to address that and he's doing like a forensic analysis of where they are because i believe that there was also some issues about the actual data right you know uh around this program so he's on it and he has expressed that this is a top priority Okay. But I can tell you in the same line of thought that um, another program of mine that is a top priority is the demolition of private property that were da damaged by Maria. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's amazing that three years later, a single private property has been demolished. And, you know, right now we are, you know, twisting the whole program to ensure that we begin the first we begin the first demolitions in May. Which these are the ones that were impacted by Maria. And uh and the, the earthquakes, no? No, no, this is a strictly Maria. Maria. There's a separate similar program with the earthquakes. Okay. But this one, it's about the the potential universe of properties that could be demolished uh, goes all the way to almost 3400. Wow. Okay. And, the most of, and are most of them homes or is there a good mix of home and commercial? Uh, do you have it's idea? It's a mix, that? but I will say that the majority are homes, but there's a mix of commercial and, 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 and per, you know, um, homes, um, residentials. Uh, but to be honest, uh, it's amazing how much it has been delayed. Finally, we have a, good, a new planning place and we're doing everything that we can. Our target is to begin the first demolitions in May. And okay. FEMA and FEMA pays for the demolition. Yes, they reimburse. They reimburse. It's, okay. Yeah, they do the reimbursement. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and then um, it would be up to the homeowner to rebuild. Or how does that? Yes, work? that's a, that's a good question. Right now, the the um, the scope only involves demolition, right? So any future development will need to be backed by other programs, potentially CDBGDR. Right. That's that's something that the Vivienda is looking at. Uh, and and, you know, we're working, you know, with FEMA, with HUD to understand, you know, the different alternatives. But I th think it will be more inclined with some of the CDGDR programs that could be used, you know, for the next steps. My goal right now is to demolish because the moment that you decide that they need to be demolished is because it, they're just beyond repair. Right. They could actually um, post a threat for life, right? Uh, so there are a lot of reasons why we need to expedite the demolition. But to your point, then the next phase will be what happens, you know, after demolition and, and CDDDR probably will play a, an important role in that. Okay, so, you know, I'm, we're unfortunately we're, we're running out of time. So to wrap it up, it seems to me like what you're saying is that 2021 is going to be a very active year for Core 3 and that people should actually and truly begin to see um, movement, construction, um, money flowing, you know, just just getting things out there and getting them done, right? Yes. Yes. 2021 is the year that we finally will be seeing uh, the action that we were expecting. But uh, let me, there's a little caveat, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, we need to align those four factors, right? I think I'm pretty confident with the first three. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and that will allow to get, you know, the, the minimum critical mass on the construction industry, right? Mm-hmm. The way I see it is that there's going to be a lot of great activity, mm-hmm. actual construction in the island mm-hmm. in 2021. And it will be like this, right? But at some point after 2021, 2022, most likely, then that curve is going to grow exponentially. So it's going to be a nice grow, you know, in terms of construction activity, 2021, mm-hmm. which is what we're expecting, but it will, it will grow probably exponentially as the heavy heaters start to get construction out there, PREPA, PRASA, and the Department of Education. Remember, yeah. out of the $23 billion obligated, 15 are those three agencies. And that's right. definitely um, a positive for the economy. Um, of course, yeah. But but it is still astounding that it, it, four years later is when we're when Puerto Rico is yes. actually getting going. So you know, um, I think people are counting on it actually happening. Um, and I, I ask you, you know, if you have any final words, you know, to those people who have been waiting for four years. Well, I will say that um, I, I'm very looking forward. Uh, you know, forward-looking person, right? Um, I, I try to describe what happened before in a general sense. It doesn't justify the fact that this has to have happened more faster, more agile. Mm-hmm. That is the truth. But moving forward, I think that we have right now the right leadership, the right vision, and key people in the key positions to ensure that we tackle these factors that we just described it and finally get this going. I'm very positive about that. Um, some people say, well, after four years at DDEC, uh, now you're kind of going back to your roots as an engineer. Mm-hmm. Uh, because my job right now is really project management. These are just processes and, 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 and goals-oriented actions, right? Uh, so I'm back on my roots as an engineer, and I'm very positive that with the team that we have at Core3 now, the support from FEMA, the support from the governor, the, the construction council, and with the municipalities, agencies, and the actual construction sector, I think that the, the ingredients are there. I think that we're finally there to see this happening. I'm very positive about that. Okay, so with that, I want to thank you very much for your time and for all of the information, and I'm hoping that we can speak again perhaps in a couple of months to see what's going on. Yes, hopefully in the next couple of months, we can talk about actual projects. Thank you very much. I appreciate whatever it. happening in, you know, in terms of construction and things like that. Very, very important. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Oh, thank you.